Yep, hi, welcome everyone. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about your artifact devastations and the mind of the So, I'm Ferris Bowman, who works as a staff engineer at GitHub, and focusing on supply chain security and are active in a lot of related open source communities such as Explore and the Update Framework. Um, hi, my name is Hans Schalten. I also work, uh, I worked for Stackdog uh, and also involved in supply chain software, open source projects like Dub and Sistock. And, and yeah, I'm going to present about Tango and one of the maintainers there. Perfect. So, uh, GitHub artifact manifestations. So, I'm just gonna mess around. Here. So, it's a fairly new feature that we uh, announced and made general available June this year. So, it's out there already. You can use it today. It's free for open source. And uh, what we're trying to do is that we offer a very easy to use way to provide. Uh, artifact integrity for all the artifacts or whatever you are building on your action. So uh, it makes it easy for any developers to have managing keys and etc. to enforce integrity protection for everything that's built on artifact that is with no media actions. Uh, it's been out for a while and we have some early adopters such as the package manager OB. Before uh, we start to talk more about like how it works and everything like that, I'll just do like a quick overview of the various components involved. So the main interface we're going to interact with is uh, a ready-to-use GitHub action that you can add to your existing workflow to start to provide uh, add stations for uh, everything you're building. And we also offer a solution for the certificate authority and all the PKI, so you as a developer or maintainer wouldn't really need to manage things as yourself. And as GitLab being owned by Microsoft, we are of course subject to all the regulations and the uh, security controls around managing the security <laughs> So we also provide an attestation <coughs> store for you. So in, you are producing like all the attestations, they are stored at trust in GitLab and they of course can be discoverable and, and downloaded by anyone. To, to work with the verification side of this, we have made a lot of changes to the GitHub CLI. So we offer a fairly simple way to express lightweight policies for you during verification. So we have that part covered as well. And if you're running, let's say, Kubernetes, uh, we have made changes to the six store policy controller, which is uh, an emission controller for Kubernetes. So everything you're building in GitHub Actions will easily be verified and, and, and set up in, in your production clusters. So, to start, uh, talk a little bit about sort of classical signing or how signing is usually done today. So, you have some build system that produces artifacts by uh, consuming materials or sources from a sort of source code management system. When the artifact is built, it's usually sent to a registry and the registry may sign it for you. So, when a client is downloading the package, they can verify that the signature is correct and so they are getting the package that you uh, the registry has actually host, so I can get tampered with. There are some other solutions where you are kind of signing during build, but that kind of adds a little bit more to the complexity because now you need to manage keys uh, in your build pipeline, and that can be complicated and it's sometimes easy to get wrong, so it's a little bit more complex scenario. So, with artifact attestations, what we're doing is that we are shifting the signing to, to the build system itself and make it in an easy way so you don't really need to manage your keys so everything kind of happens automatically for you. Also as part of signing this and, and building the artifact, you also capture a lot of non-portable metadata to describing the build and that's usually what we would call the build provenance. Uh, and this metadata provides a lot of more information instead of just describing a single artifact, it's like the build, like what workload is executing, uh, which Git repository, Git LOD, and so on. And that allows a consumer to have much more of which policies we written about. So we have more information to work with when we're deciding if we're going to trust this artifact or not. And to get away from a problem that's 
hopefully quite hard, is around identity, man identity management uh, in the PKI. So you need to know like who is the user that was signing this, is it allowed to sign and so on. So instead of relying on union identities, we are shifting to use workload identities instead, because we think that gives you uh, an easier data model to reason about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as I said, we are providing all the public key infrastructure for you. So as a developer or maintainer, you don't need to manage any keys at all. So when we started to build out this, uh, we wanted to use as much open source possible as possible because we want to use, we want to meet the user where we're already at, and we don't want to add any more information to the system. We don't want to create our own folk data formats or proprietary formats. We want to use as much open source as possible. So three of the big open source projects we're relying on are Adaptive Framework, which is a way to provide trusted updates over an insecure channel. We're also relying on the Salsa, which is a supply, supply chain security framework that offers various descriptions for how to reason about your bills and how to stay secure the bill itself. But the primary thing that we are relying on is uh, the Salsa defined bid problem specification that describes the form of the shape of the bid problems. So that means that we can align with that existing tooling out there for Salsa. We are not creating something own that Salsa so works by and uh, relying on what's called in total attestations, which is basically a statement layer around the actual big problems document, and that allows you to bind this metadata to a specific artifact that you have built. Uh, for signing, we are looking into SIGSTOR. So SIGSTOR offers um, an easy to use way to, to sign and verify binary artifacts but also provides um, sort of a PKI model that relies on identity federation. So that offers us a solution to sort of um, federate with heat actions and so we can easily manage workload identities that would be the identity of the sign. Uh, what's also very interesting with Six Door is that it's not just an open source project where they are writing and providing the source code. Six Door itself also offers what's called uh, the public good instance. So they're also defined to provide the infrastructure so you can use it without spinning up any other code from your from own. So a quick overview of kind of what's happening is that when the workflow starts to run, you invoke our action and the action will generate a key and it will uh, um, retrieve a signing certificate from FOSI, which is a CA component in six door. And then it will use the signing certificate to sign the big problems that actions uh, generated during the execution. Once everything is produced and signed, it will be stored in our attestation store. And then if you look at it from uh, the receiver side, in this case, I'm using the GitHub CLI as an example, but uh, the, the interaction will start that will first in initiate a contact to our top, rep top repository where you can download the trust group, which is basically the certificate chain describing the CAs. With that, uh, the CLI can then compute the message digest of an artifact and clear our attestation store with that message digest. So it's a content addressable storage. And then if you're able to download an attestation and run through the verification to see that everything works. So yeah, let's dig a bit more into some details. So uh, as an example here, I'm just going to show how a typical salsa build document might, may look like. So you can see that there are a lot of information here like what are the source code repositories being used, what are the git OID, what are the git ref, uh, what's the actual workflow being invoked. And we also see that we have some numerical IDs and that allows us to write policies that are resistant to resurrection or rename attacks. So and, and as I said like this is an open standard like this is not something that we, we made like we're using existing components out there. For signing, uh, as I mentioned, we're relying on six store and, and what I think is sort of the, the best selling point is that you can use what's referred to as ephemeral keys or sometimes um, keyless signing. Basically that allows you to create a one of them use key in memory, use that to sign, then dispose of keys. So you're basically uh, 
protecting against key behaviors. And for this, also this is actual CM component, the certificate component that we're using. And as I mentioned, we are relying on workload identities. And in this case, the workload identity would be the organization repository and workload. So doing verification is very easy to say, like, yeah, I trust this identity because this is a repository I trust or it's coming from an organization that I trust. And, and the benefit here is that you don't need to think about key management, like how are you managing your keys? Are they a flat file on disk or are you using HSM keys? How do you distribute that information? And how do you communicate to consumers who are allowed to sign a release binary or who was allowed to sign this release that was made one year ago? It's definitely possible to solve, but for, for smaller projects, it might be quite burdensome to do that. And we think shifting to a six door model simplifies this a lot. To just explain a little bit more about the ephemeral signing to kind of get an understanding of how it works. So the action produces a new key pair, private, private public key pair in memory. And then it extracts an ID token from uh, the GitHub Actions OpenID Connect provider. And then it requests a signing certificate from Folsio by providing the public key and the ID token. Folsio is federated with uh, the OpenID Connect provider and so it can verify that no the ID token is correct, it's valid, and it actually describes the identity it should. Then Fulsio can take that information, inject it as extensions into the certificate, and of course the, uh, the identity, and return that back to the action who can then sign it. Uh, what's not really shown here is another important uh, component that, because the certificates generated from Fulsio are extremely short-lived, they are only valid for 10 minutes. Uh, so there are another thing happening here as well where we are getting like a third party timestamp to this as well because you need that timestamp during verification to make sure that the signature happened when uh, the certificate was valid. So as I mentioned with SIGSTOR, there is a public good instance out there today. It's free for use, everyone can use it and we are relying on that for uh, any public repositories that are being built and attested with artifact attestations. Uh, this instance is operated by the Sigstore community and members of my team are also on call for that as well. Uh, there is a potential problem is that uh, the public good Sigstore instance relies on a lot of public ledgers, oops, a lot of public ledgers that sort of persist metadata describing the builds. So that could potentially be Interesting. Maybe the AJ might set glitch. Hmm. It's there. Sorry for this. I think I can continue to talk while they're trying to figure out uh, um, the issue of the video. So, uh, yeah, as I said, like the public instance is out there for SIGSTOR, everyone can use it, but uh, a lot of information is persisted on a, on, on a append-only ledger, which means that once it's out there, you can't really revoke that data. So to be able to provide some privacy guarantees, we are hosting a private instance at GitHub, so anyone can sign using that, and with that, the data won't leave. Uh, GitHub f facilities. So, so if you are concerned about any privacy, uh, the, the private instance would be the one to use, and it happens default by any private repositories. And of course, the one, the instance we are operating is fully compatible with the public good instance. So, during verification or consumptions, there are no difference at all. And I will not start to talk about the next one because that would be maybe confusing for you. So I'm going to wait. I 
that is a question. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> magic. <laughs> so yeah, let's get going. <laughs> So yeah, as I mentioned, like big uh, public SIG store is out there. Uh, there might be some concern with with privacy leaks, but we think there's also a lot of other use cases why it's worth the trouble of building out this new thing, artifact data stations. And one of them is that SIG store itself is mostly concerned about signing and verification, but we want to provide sort of a, a more batteries included style of experience where the provenance data is automatically generated. You wouldn't need to consider that as a burden of the, of the maintainers as well. So automatic generation of build provenance is something that we think is extremely important to make it easy to adopt, lower the barriers of entry. Just a question. Um, this verification for this build provenance, is this in total? Yes. Exactly yeah, okay. yeah. It's an in total statement containing a salsa build provenance predicate correct so also as i mentioned like six store itself does, doesn't really care about where you are storing your uh, attestation so we provide a ready to use solution for that attestation storage is content addressable which means that it's easy to discover and at stations and also like it has all the access controls that you would expect you can make sure who are allowed to read or write from this storage so yeah, how, how to use it? So we want to make sure it's easy as possible to use it. So it's literally a, a few lines of YAML that you need to add to your existing workflow to use this. In this case, um, the example workflow is building uh, an OCI image, but you can see that I've added a new step called a test image and it invokes uh, our action for producing build provenance. And then we need to set some parameters for instance, we need to capture the build digest produced by the build step. Uh, and when this is run, it will automatically sign and create a build provenance and upload it to, to our attestation store. But you can also see here, I've added like a flag push to registry. And it means that we will also push the build attestation to the OCI registry itself, because it may be convenient for you during like uh, verification that pull down the attestation next to the image. So you don't need to sort of grant your production system access to let's say github and you maybe don't want to have um, deploy time dependency on our attestation store uh, we're using the first api if possible otherwise we're falling back to rely on some uh, tag management uh, yeah in this case uh, attest uh, an oci image but it works pretty much with any binary or it works with any binary artifact that you are producing. And yes, we have a ready to use SBOM action as well. So it will automatically bind the SBOM to uh, the artifact that you were producing in your build job. Uh, I will show this more as well, but uh, there is a tab you can see all the attestations that are being produced by, by your building as well. And of course you can click on them and you will see like an, a summary of all the details in the metadata showing like uh, the repository, the workflow, the, the git OID and the git ref and all that. So it's like an easy, easy way to consume it for like human consumption. So signing without verification, yeah, you shouldn't do it. It's bad because <laughs> the kind of thing is that you want to verify that the things you're consuming are what you should trust. So. Uh, data stations that we are producing are compatible with Cosine, which is the primary six store CLI. It's quite painful to do it, but it's possible. So we added a lot of thought into the GitHub CLI to make like uh, the most common examples very easy to use without sort of re relying on more complicated uh, policy engines. Uh, and as I mentioned, we also have made changes to the six store policy controller. So it's easy to consume if you want to protect your production workload in Kubernetes. And final thing before demo, like just talk a little bit about uh, the security considerations using this. Uh, and it's super important to understand sign does not mean <coughs> secure. Just because something is signed, it doesn't mean that the project is following whatever be best practices around, let's say, building in GitHub Actions or not doing, I don't know, um, dependency management in, let's say, a fishy way. So what we are 
providing via build data stations. It's the traceability back to the actual workflow that was building it. So that is like more or less the only security guarantee we are giving you. So you may need to audit the, the actual project you will depend on, but it allows you to verify that the artifact is actually coming from this project that you audited and trust. There are some things you can do to kind of increase uh, the security, like for instance, you can have code owners uh, specifying that the build instructions can only be ma managed by a different team, or for instance, you can rely on reusable workflow, which is a way to, or a good way to basically add a separation of concerns where you can have one team managing the build instructions and another team uh, managing the source code. And there are already existing reusable workflows out there, like there is, for instance, one managed by the Salsa team themselves to, to build artifacts. So this means that as the developers are adding code, they will never be able to modify the inputs to the build, except, of course, which source code is going to be built. And reusable, will, reusable workflows also have a lot of other good security guarantees, like, for instance, you get uh, proper build isolation when uh, the reusable workflow is starting to execute, it will always do so in a new fresh VM, so you won't have any sort of legacy part where you can, for instance, have uh, a fishy unit test that overwrites the compiler or something like that. Those kind of attacks are more or less uh, mitigated by relying on reusable workflows. So with that, uh, I wanna switch to quick demo, but before that, I'm gonna give some context on the demo, so. Oh, there we go. So, for some context, this, by the way, I can't see it, but it doesn't matter. So this is sort of the workflow that I'm using to create the demo. So I think you should be able to see that there are three different jobs. One that builds direct in the repository, and then there is a build job called build debug, and then there is a third one called build release. So basically we are producing three different uh, artifacts here, and that's basically just to be, show, be able to show some uh, some of the behaviors, so, and also just as an example, like everything you can, s oh, wait, where is this? Uh, is this at the stations, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, so yeah, everything is here. So for like a human, it's, yeah, you can get all the information out here. So uh, now I'm gonna try to remove all this and, oops, this is, Quite hard, actually. Uh, uh, oh, I actually do it like this. Oh, come on. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> actually, I'm going to do oh, magic. Where's my point? There it is. So, I'm going to go to screen mirror because this will be very annoying otherwise. Fingers crossed, nothing broke. It didn't. I'm just going to clean up. So, yeah, uh, remove this one and enter full screen. So, uh, we have some examples that I've prepared here. So, uh, this command, oh, this is not easy to read. Ah.
is it possible to read this? Yeah, so super simple example. So with the GH CLI or the GitHub CLI, I just want to ver verify that uh, this artifact that I have is originating from, in this case, my repository GHA demo coming from my user. So what's happening here is that we're first computing the SHA-2 message digest of the artifact, querying via that digest and trying to find any other stations. And then we are, of course, comparing the message digest from the content of the art, uh, artifact data station and then verify all the uh, cryptography part of it. And we can see here that everything passed. We can see it's coming from the expected repository. It's salsa build provenance. It, it was built from um, this workflow using this git ref. So we have uh, another way. So you can add dash dash format JSON if you want to have a more rich output. And this is more like if you want to have more elaborate policies being executed with, let's say, OPA or Q or whatever favorite tool you have. Uh, for instance, we can just take a look at this one. So this debug was built using a reusable workflow and we can see here it's failing because uh, when you're building with a reusable workflow, the signer identity will be the reusable workflow, not the originating repository, so it will fail. But that allows us to say that uh, we can specify, sure, it should be, uh, I'm taking this one, it should be still originating from the expected repository, but it should be built with the debug reusable workflow. And now it works. So by using reusable builders, you can reusable workflows, you can have like different identities for the repository producing the source code and the actual signing workflow signing it. So it gives you a little bit more expressiveness. And yeah, that's it for the demo. So now I will lead it to Rado. So, hello again, uh, my name is Radoslav, and my talk is about Minder and how you can use the information that the stations gives you to actually create policies and consume it, consume the metadata in, the, in those attestations in a kind of automated way. So, my part of the presentation is basically about this. Um, this diagram depicts one of the basics principles of economics, if I can say it in that way. So we produce something, we distribute it, and then we consume it. I'm here because of the third part of the consumption part and how that can be applied at scale. So in this talk, we'll talk about Minder and how Minder consumes that data. We can see how we can leverage that information from the attestation and create a policy to protect the artifacts that we created the attestation for. So what is Minder? Um, Minder is an open source platform, platform that allows you to create and enforce profiles, basically describe your desired security posture in a profile and Minder will monitor and enforce all of those policies and even remediate most of them. So it integrates across the whole software development lifecycle. It tracks the security posture and supports policy driven reconciliations. And of course, it's an open source project. There is also um, 
a service that we handle for you, which is forever free for open source projects. And of course, it's a community centric project. Um, so those are some of the things that, some of the key features of Minder. It allows you to configure uh, secure source code repository. It allows you to configure repositories securely in a, in a scalable manner. So you can manage and monitor repository configuration. Um, it lets you apply, const yeah, sorry. It lets, you, it lets you apply also policies across all of those repositories. So the practical thing here is you can describe your policy only once and that policy will be applied across all of your repositories in your organization. And if one of the repositories drifts away from that desired security posture, Minder will actually try to fix it and you will not even be uh, kind of vulnerable to that change or it will alert you that, okay, something happened, you have to address it. So that's the multi-repo configuration and security part. Um, it also covers the dependency management part where it helps you have safer open source dependencies. So it's not only flags dependencies in your pull requests that have, for example, known CVs or are perhaps suspicious for you to use, but it also lists safer alternatives. So you open a pull request in some of your repositories. If the version that you are trying to introduce to your project is susceptible to CVs or it's, yeah, there is a problem with it. Minder will actually advise you and it will comment uh, with a suggestion about the version that has this fixed. Or it will even suggest an alternative project that can, I mean, that you can actually move to. Um, it also helps you securing the GitHub actions in your CI CD pipelines. So it implements the GitHub recommended best practices for pinning the GitHub actions that you use, limiting the workflow permissions. And again, this happens in an automated and a scalable way. So you define it only once. And in the context of this talk, it's, it helps you build tamper-proof container images and ensure that you build that across the time. So it integrates with SIGSTORE and SALSA and it provides assurance to, cons to consumers that the packages what they intended to publish and hasn't been, been altered by a malicious actor. So in the context of this demo, uh, in, this exam in this talk, we'll have a simple, a simple Go application that is an HTTP server that um, has a workflow that builds and publishes a container image and pushes it to a container registry. So it's a very simplified but very common scenario. We've seen this picture a few times, this figure a few times already. So this is the, an overview of the supply chain uh, threads kind of model. Um, so we can see where threads occur, where threads and, threads and risk occur in the software supply chain. And the example application that we're going to use for this demo is, we'll try to cover basically this, uh, this flow. So we have source, which is the, the repository, the settings of the repository, our codes. We have the build part, which is the part that produces the container artifact. And we have package, which is the output of that and where we store it. And of course we have also dependencies. So in this talk, <coughs> the demo that we'll be doing is focusing on that part of the supply chain. So we will see what happens if there is a compromise in the build system the example that we we'll have is an, an, how to say it, an unknown actor that uh, compromised one of the workflows in your repository and tried to build the container image from there. So that workflow will still have the same secrets as your official build, re build and release workflow, but will be uh, like compromised. The second demo is about having uh, someone that compromised your container registry. So or package, hi package hijacking, I think it's called. Um, this example is if someone gained access to your container registry and pushed a malicious image out of bounds. So it 
didn't go through your repository at all. And um, yeah, those are the two, the, the three things, that, the two things that I want to uh, want to share. Um, I will. Isn't going to be difficult. I don't know how you managed to do it. Uh, so, oops, so, I think it's easier like that. Uh, so, this is the example. Uh, this is the example repository. Uh, it's a very simple one. As you can see, it's just a simple HTTP server. So we have three workloads and this is the workflow that is, let's say, the, the goods are clicked here, by the way. Um, so this is the, the normal workflow that we'll be using uh, as an example of how project builds their container image without any notion of attestations or GitHub or a six store signing. So we build the image and we push it to the container registry. And in the first example, which is about the, um, the compromise of, a, of the build system, we have this workflow. which again does the same thing. It even generates the attestation, but it has this build malicious step, which what it does is, I can show the, the make file target later, but it appends a comment to the make file, simulating that the code is compromised. So if we do that, um, let me just, so I will run this, just so I can show the, the image digest of the image that is being built. And this is going to be harder than I expected. I wanted to show basically that there is no way for us to, to find out if something like that happened without any automation or any policies being applied. This workflow will build an image with a certain digest. And if in the case of a compromised build system, we build another image and publish it, that will have another digest. And unless we have a way to kind of automate all of this, there is no way for the user to, to understand that this was compromised. So it will take some time until someone actually realizes that. Um, yeah. Okay, I think I can skip that part so it's, it doesn't take too much time. Um, so how can, how can we protect about this? Let me go back to the slides. So how can we protect about this? Because there will be no way to, to realize that this happened and we will end up in more or less this situation. What Minder, what Minder can do in that situation is actually get the, that metadata information that is in the attestation and create a policy around it. So in this case, we'll build up I'll run that workflow to generate the attestation in the meantime and I will go and so, so let's try to set up Minder with that. Uh, the first thing is to create an account in Minder so that will allow you to have like the functionality to enroll your repositories, create profiles in real times. Um, once we have created the account, we need to register the repository that we are interested in. You can register, you, you create a, an application that is installed on your GitHub organization and you can select which repositories that you want this profile to be applied to. So in this case, we'll register only one uh, and then we'll create the profile with the 
expected metadata that we want to get from that station. So in this case, this is how Miner looks like. Um, I have already granted it access to the organization that I want to add. So this is the repository that we have in mind. And the repository is registered, but we don't have any profiles yet. So this is how we can create a profile. I won't use any of the suggested ones. I want to use uh, my own custom profile. So let's say OSS unit demo. And now we are presented with the screen to choose what kind of policy we want to enforce on this prof uh, on this uh, on this project basically with this profile. So we have a bunch of um, rule types that we can use. Rule types are basically the, the rules within a profile, so that's the policy that we're going to check. Um, in this case, we're going to use the verify the in integrity of an artifact using Salsa. So we're adding that rule type. And now we have to specify the things that are um, describing our desired security posture. So all of those things are things that one can configure. Um, in order to know what we want to do there, um, let's say that we, uh, in this case, we built an image that has attestations. So we can go at the last job that happened. Uh, we can see the attestation that was created for this job. And we can see that Basically, all, all of this is the metadata that is part of the attestation. And we can start populating these fields to the rule type. So let's start one by one. So we want to say our policy is basically let's have all of our latest images be compliant with that. So we can do like wild cards of image types and everything else. We care about the container um, images artifact types. We want this container to be run only from the workflow dispatch event. So you can, or maybe push and pull if there is a uh, different configuration that you want to be applied for your use case. So the runner environment is basically the runner that started, that built that container image. You can specify that this is uh, GitHub hosted. This is the identity that built that artifact. So in this case, this is the workflow that you want to have, which is this one here. And this is the reference. So someone can try to push that, that container image from the same workflow, but if it's not merged in main, uh, it will again fail. And we can even specify the repository, but in this case we won't. Uh, we want to make it as kind of white as possible. So we are creating this rule type. And what now will happen is Minder will reconcile and it will list all the repositories and alert you if something is not as what you expect. In this case, of having a live demo. Uh, did I mess up something? Oh, that's embarrassing. I, <laughs> I guess I messed up something. Um, yeah, I'm sorry uh, for this, but basically the idea is that with this we we can we can create policies and we'll be able to be notified about every disruption that happens around this desired posture that we have. 
And I think what Minder does in, in tries to solve is that it solves the problem of the adoption because we have all of these technologies that we're discussing throughout this conference and all of them are producing very meaningful content, but it's hard to, to consume them in a manner that is automated and um, basically also scalable. So I think it's a positive thing to have and yeah, this will strengthen the security posture of the open source software. Yeah, apologize.